What is going on, Pacer Nation? Welcome back to another episode here of Setting the Pace. I'm your host, Alex Golden, and this man is on top in the world. It's the one and only Michael J. Fachi. Fachi, what's going on, brother? Oh, man. Alex, I have been waiting for this. Couldn't wait for you to get back to town because it happened. OB Toppin is an Indiana Pacer. Look, I know I'm not the only one, but I felt like some ESPN train machine madman after this came down. After it happened because I had crafted up so many trades over the past, I don't know, year or two, whatever it was, trying to bring Obi to Indiana. Somehow, the front office topped me, and they got him for even less than I had ever even offered the Knicks. Two second round picks. Alex, what was your initial reaction? Because I was running wild. Man, yeah. So let's just kind of back things up here because on Friday night, there was a report. I I feel terrible because I can't remember who it was, but it was a, an account that had like a just over a thousand followers that said Obi Toppin's been traded to the Pacers. And people were asking me about it. I started asking around. And basically, the intel I was getting was I haven't heard anything on this. I'm like, okay. I'm not saying this guy's wrong. I'm not trying to give this guy like a, you know, this guy's an idiot. Don't trust me. He doesn't always talking about it. it's fake stuff. No, I was like, no, I, I haven't heard anything. So when I heard that, I was like, okay, maybe there's something in the works. And then, like you know, I was gone this weekend at a wedding. A buddy of mine texted me and said, yeah, Zach Lowe said on his podcast that you know there's a good chance Obi Toppin's coming to the Pacers. Chris Duarte is going to the Kings. And I was like, oh, is this some kind of three team deal? So I texted you about it. And I said, we got to wait and see what happens. And then all of a sudden, we get the Woj bomb. And I was like, okay, so it's official. OB for two seconds. Like, my initial thoughts were like, man, does this guy know what he's talking about? To, okay, Woj confirmed it. We're good to go now. Uh, it's official. But I was just a little bit surprised by the asking price. I, I cannot believe that he was available for just two second round picks. I have a ton of friends since I live in the New York area that are Knicks fans. And they could not believe it either. They know that, yes, Obi was never given that fair shake to be a starter because he plays behind Julius Randle. But to give him up for two seconds, they kept saying, why wouldn't you just go into the regular season with Obi? And then you could always revisit or do that at the deadline. But to do it now, it, it was puzzling for them. It was a major win for us. And how many times have we said, why doesn't the front office roll the dice on a player with upside when it's only costing a handful of second round picks. We saw yeah. Rui Hachimura go for three second round picks and we thought we couldn't beat that deal. But now this time around, hats off to the front office going after a player in a true buy low opportunity. And I know it's been pointed out on Twitter, but when the Pacers move back from seven to eight and they acquire two second round picks, this is the type of deal that you finally include those second round picks in. And I got one more for you. What about when the Pacers acquired three second round picks to take Jordan Awara, George Hill and Serge Ibaka. Like, we were stockpiling these assets, wondering, uh, another second round pick. Well, you know what? It all paid off with that deal for Obi Toppin. Yeah. And I mean, here's the thing we don't know what picks are going to be yet. Exactly. None of the details have come out. It can't happen till Thursday. Mm -hmm. But I will say this I think the new CBA has changed the way teams are operating. So that's probably why the Knicks didn't hold on to him. Maybe they didn't want to have that locker room friction with Obi's frustration. Uh, to start the year off. I don't know if he would really been that big of a headache. I don't really think he comes across that way to me, but uh, reporting in New York is always more magnified than I think the actuality of it of course. because it's New York. It's a big market. But one thing we have to remember too, is they wanted to bring in Dante DiVincenzo mm -hmm. and they didn't sign him to his contract until this trade took place or this was announced. So I think that maybe by re moving off of OB, there was some kind of money shifting that allowed them to have the space to bring in Dante DiVincenzo, which, hey, I'm not trying to hit on DiVincenzo, but I kind of like the ceiling of Obi Toppin a little bit more than Dante. So, you know, get the Villanova boys back together in New York. That's a fun storyline for that team. But Obi Toppin coming to the Pacers, who just drafted a power forward, and they've desperately needed a power forward for a long time. Great opportunity for Obi and great opportunity for the Pacers to kind of see what they can get here. Couldn't agree more. I mean, look, the, the Knicks ended up saving about $6.8 million in the process. Then they end up making the move for Dante DiVincenzo. Look, if they're happy, that's great. We're thrilled over here. Had the opportunity to change, exchange a, a quick message with someone inside the Pacers organization. They said, quote, we are extremely optimistic about this group moving forward. And that, for me, whoo, 
That was enough because I just felt like they're excited. When you get a player of this caliber, a former top 10 pick, Alex, let's think about this, the 2020 draft, because we're, we're out here like Thanos acquiring every single lottery pick we can from that draft. I mean, we have Obi, we have Halliburton, we have Jalen Smith, we have Aaron Neesmith, and then even later on, Jordan Awara. Mm. But when we look back, the guy that we actually selected in that draft, the 54th overall pick, Cashy Stanley, we painted him as, oh, he is super athletic. You know, he could jump out of the building. I'm sorry, but Obi Toppin can do that and a lot more and actually be, you know, a really, really, we'll say, promising basketball player moving forward. So in a, in about three years, that 2020 draft class ended up being a very pivotal one for the Indiana Pacers if they really have the true aspirations to keep pushing forward. Yeah, I'll say this about that draft class when Obi Toppin was selected eighth overall by the New York Knicks. I thought to myself, this guy's got a real chance to be the rookie of the year. He was coming in a, a, a polished player. He's a, what is he? Year. Yeah, 25 years old. Is that how, he, how yep. old he is right mm-hmm. now? Yeah. So it's not like he's this young 21-year-old that's been in the league for a couple of years. No, he was older when he was drafted. So I think sometimes that kind of pushes a timeline on people a little bit you know, quicker than other teams. Like you look at an Isaiah Jackson, a guy has been in the league for two years. You know, It's like, well, he's only 21. There's still so much room for him to prove. But you look at a guy like Kobe Top, it's like, well, he's going into year four. He's 25 years old. Like, have we really seen um, his ceiling? Or is there more there? I don't know. So let's move off of him. We don't feel like he's that valuable. And the same can be said for Chris Duarte. So we're not going to dive into the Chris Duarte stuff right now on this podcast because we're going to be doing a podcast series. Uh, we're just strictly talking about Obi Toppin on today's show. But we wanted to touch on the Chris Duarte stuff quickly, Fachi, because we found out from Shams on Friday, that he was traded to the Kings for draft considerations, but nothing has ever come after that to give us details on it. Like I said, Zach Lowe had mentioned it, that Duarte was getting sent to the Kings and then mentioned Obi Toppin was coming to the Pacers. It almost sounded like it was going to maybe be a three-team deal. But then there was reports that said that those deals are completely separate. They don't have anything to do with each other. So while we're still waiting on Chris Duarte, we do know that he's not a part of this team. And with these, uh, the signing of Bruce Brown Jr. and now the trade for Obi Toppin, our roster is officially full at 15 players unless there are other trades made. So wanted to clarify that um, we do know that Duarte is on the move <laughs> more than likely. We just don't know when that's going to happen or what, what that's for. But uh, I just love Obi Toppin's potential. I think it's there, Foch. I really do. And I want to backtrack what I said a little bit on Twitter when I threw the Jermaine O'Neal picture out there. We've talked about this before on this podcast. We're not strictly saying, oh, he's going to be Jermaine O'Neal. Some people are miss, you know, taking that take that I put out there. I said, have a Jermaine O'Neal like moment where he can kind of spread his wings and fly a little bit, come into Indiana where there's a bigger opportunity for him. And not to mention, he gets to play with one of the best point guards in the NBA and arguably the best point guard in the Eastern Conference. Absolutely. And look, it's we're not saying this is a six-time all-star right over here. No, but what we're saying is this is a guy who's going to step into a new role and be able to flourish, be able to be the player that everybody thought he could be when drafted. And there's a couple of guys that if you look at, you know, let's just throw out some names over there. You know, Chris Middleton started his career with the Pistons, didn't do that much, goes to Milwaukee, ends up being a totally different player. Chauncey Billups bounced around plenty before he became the Chauncey Billups that we knew in Detroit. Kyle Lowry. Started with the Memphis Grizzlies. I mean, it took him quite a few years before he blossomed into a six-time All-Star. We're just saying this is someone that you're going to see a player that very much needed a change of scenery. He was playing behind Julius Randle, who had just been an All-NBA player, made All-Star game two of the last three years. It was really hard to get minutes in New York, especially under Coach Tibbs, who's known for playing his starters just about more more than any other coach plays their starters. So this guy, he's got a chip on his shoulder. Alex, I don't even think you could fit it in a Dorito bag. That chip is that big. He's hungry. He's starving. He's entering essentially a contract year of hitting restricted free agency after this year. You're going to get a guy who's ready to prove the world wrong, and that is a scary player, and I'm happy to have him on our team. No, you're totally right about that. And I think coming in with that chip on his shoulder with something to prove, we've seen how that's been beneficial for a guy like Miles Turner last year who was in a contract year yep. trying to prove his worth. Look, Obi Toppin's doing the same thing here because, yeah, the Pacers did not draft him whatsoever, and they only took two second-round picks to get him. So they're not at all tied to him. And he has to remember that they just drafted a guy on their own mm-hmm. 
two weeks ago and Jairus Walker. And that is someone that I think they believe in a lot. And yep. so Obi Toppin has to realize like, okay, yeah, I might be a little bit more experienced right now than this 19 year old kid, but they invested a lot in him and they didn't invest nearly as much in me. So who's, who's higher on the pecking order. That's a great question. I think we're going to find out as the years play along, but great opportunity for him to slide right in there. So Let's just kind of transition now and talk about his fit with this team because I'm really curious what your thoughts are on his game and how it fits with this team. So in terms of, you know, a fit, we're talking about six foot nine with a seven foot two wingspan. Uh, at, at this point, we, we mentioned the four spot was really where the Pacers needed more depth. You had Jarris Walker, you had Jordan Wara. You felt like that really wasn't enough. We felt that Jarris Walker probably wouldn't be a starter from day one, but you know what? We wanted to bring in maybe someone a little bit more experienced. Obi likes to run. He he fits our style. The Pacers were fifth in pace last year. He is saying he's a lob threat almost doesn't do him justice. This man can fly out of the ceiling. So Halbert even joked right away saying, I feel like this is like Mahomes to Tyree Kill. I'm just going to throw it down there, knowing that he's down there. So that has me really excited. Um he 74 percent of his shots came at the rim however he also expanded upon his three-point attempts over the last you know year or so we saw more three-point attempts especially over the last two years and i think at this point being someone who is in a contract year if it doesn't work out the pacers can move on they can have a qualifying offer out there and ride it out but it's not like they gave him this contract extension off of just potential they're waiting and for that that puts us in a really good spot yeah, no, I think what you brought to the table was great there, especially his three-point shooting, how it's improved percentage-wise. I shot about 34% last year, almost 35, which is average, which is not bad. Yeah. And he had it on more attempts, so that's a good mm-hmm. thing. We saw that when he played the Pacers, like he was putting the ball in the hoop from outside, and I think giving him a bigger opportunity to do that, you could see more of an improvement as well. The insane athleticism is what stands out to me, though. Like, yes. This is a guy that loves to go between the legs before he dunks on a fast break. Like he's just that confident in his skill set and his athleticism. So you have to believe that'll translate as well. And I think that him being more athletic and being bigger, we're going to see a more defensive version of Obi Top. And look, Coach Tom Thibodeau preaches defensive instincts and and, and defensive uh, fundamentals. Rick Carlisle is old school too. He's not going to put up with any bull crap. So. I think at the end of the day, you're going to get a guy that's going to have to really buy in on the defensive end to get the playing time that he wants because the person the Pacers drafted behind him is a defensive menace. So Obi Toppin's going to earn his minutes, in my opinion, based on how he performs defensively. The offense is great. I think that it makes a lot of sense. And like you said, Tyrese was talking about him being a lob threat. The Pacers have desperately needed a lob threat. Isaiah Jackson uh, is probably their only lob threat currently on that team. And Isaiah Jackson is about the same weight and three inches taller than Obi Toppin. Uh, so, you know, Isaiah is a little bit too small to be out there playing uh, consistent minutes, but the Pacers desperately needed a power forward for since basically since Thad Young was uh, left in free agency. Like they haven't really addressed it. And I think Thad was limited to what he could do as a player. But, you know, I, I think this is a really nice piece to go out there and get, take a flyer on. The only thing that I feel like could be a bit of a knock he strictly feels like a four to me. I don't see Obi yes. Toppin as a small forward. And I think because of that, I don't see Jairus Walker as a small forward either. I think mm-hmm. they both pretty much play the same position. The only thing that could be enticing to me is if Jairus can maybe play small ball five, but he's only six, eight. He's smaller than Toppin too. So there's excitement with those two playing together potentially, but I do wish that maybe the Pacers would have found a three, four instead of just strictly a four. I completely agree. Look, if there was a player like an OG or DeAndre Hunter that were available, sure, that would have been amazing. But we've heard that, hey, look, those asking prices might have been a bit too much. What I do like it between Obi and Jarris Walker, despite playing the same position, is it feels like they're the yin to their yang. Like, Jarris Walker, you're going to get a really good defensive four. Obi, you're getting a high offensive upside four. And it's like, you know... Obviously, if there was a way to get the best out of both of them, hey, look, that that would be an amazing four. But maybe they can complement each other in certain lineups. I know that it, it, you mentioned Jarris would have to play more of a small ball, you know, five. And in this situation, despite Obi being six nine, he's not playing small ball five. That's not his style. And people think, hey, look, high flyer, you know, likes to run six foot nine. Could you play him at the three? 
it really hasn't been that great. So I think they're both the experiment is at the four, but between Obi, Jarris, and Jordan Awara now, you feel much better about the power forward spot than you did, say, two weeks ago. For sure. So, I mean, you know, we sent over an outline of how we're going to cover this. And so I want to ask you before we get into his numbers as a starter in New York, do you think he starts over Jarris Walker? I do. And I'll tell you why. Look, we saw nothing was handed to Benedict Matherin. You know, yeah. we, we even though, hey, hey look, he's, he's the sixth overall draft pick. It, it didn't work out that way. I think at age 19, let's be honest, he's about a year removed out of high school. Mm-hmm. Obi Toppin, 25 years old, going into year four, a, a little bit, you know, not to say a little bit, he is more experienced. He's played in the playoffs. He's been around the NBA. I think that on opening night, I see Obi Toppin as the starter. I don't think that he's achieved anything to guarantee being the starting four moving forward. He's got to earn that. And I think just to your point that you mentioned earlier, that's a great spot for us because now that's competition. And yeah. competition brings out the best. Maybe later in the year, Jarris Walker is that starting four. And I think we would all like for Jarris Walker to take that starting spot at some point. Yeah, I think it's interesting because you have to realize, like, when the Pacers traded for Tyrese, they got Buddy and Tristan Thompson in that trade. Buddy was able to kind of prove himself as a nice piece in Carlisle's offense with Tyrese. Now, they come into this with them both having something to prove, both having to earn that starting spot and not being given game you know, time to really show that. So I think that it's more than likely going to be Obi Toppin. I would be surprised if it's not. But I think that this is more up for battle or up for debate mm-hmm. than maybe Benedict and Buddy was, even though we thought it was pretty easy, like just start the guy you drafted yeah. six overall. But I also agree with you. I think that it's more likely OB for the simple fact that we know Jarris is 19 years old and it's going to take him a little bit of time to develop and, and grow into what the NBA game is actually like. So he's going to get the playing time. He's going to get experience. But I think OB having three years under his belt already is going to allow him to be more prepared for what's to come, playing heavy minutes in the NBA, playing uh, against NBA-level competition, because we know Jarris, yeah, at college, there's some NBA-level players there, but it's a totally different game because you got NBA-level players all over the place. It's NBA. It's not college. So I just feel like that's the main reason why I'm focused on Jarris being that backup, at least for this year. And then we know that Obi Toppin is a restricted free agent, if this is a flop and he doesn't fit, well, you move on. You got Jairus right there. Or you bring him back and let them battle it out next year once again for that spot. So I think you're in a good position either way for the Pacers to kind of let this work out here. But I'm curious. I know you have doing some research. So hit me up with those numbers that Obi Toppin showed when he was a starter with the New York Knicks. Oh, yeah. You know, I keep the shovel on me. I was digging deep for some stats. So starting out, look, we saw this graphic all over Twitter, but in Obi's 15 career starts. He has averaged 20.8 points per game, 5.7 rebounds, and 3.1 assists. Now, was he efficient? Well, he did it on 57.6% shooting from the field and 44% from three. If you're wondering, well, what about his three-point attempts? It was 40 of 91, and he was plus 81 in those 15 starts. He also was extremely efficient from the line, 36 of 43, ends up being 84%. So you like what you saw in the starts, but I could do you one better. This okay. Very, you know, particular stat. But when he played 28 minutes per game, uh, 28 minutes in any game, he averaged 24.9 points per game, 5.8 rebounds on 54% shooting, and was 103 of 177 from three, good for 43%. Mm. How about that? That screams, man, this guy needs more opportunity. And he's ready to showcase it. So, yeah, I mean, that that that's all exciting. And I think what this Pacers team has proven, if you come to our team and you're a young player, we're going to give you the opportunity to showcase yep. yourself. I mean, that's kind of been the MO since they traded for Halliburton. They got Aaron Neesmith, and look what he showed last year. I mean, Aaron Neesmith, to me, was a terrific fill-in at the four, but not a long-term option. Exactly. And now we, we heard KP talk about him being that six-man kind of guy, whatever. That allows Aaron Neesmith to maybe play a better role for himself, and that can be a guy that comes in off the bench. He can play the three. He can play the two if you need him to. I think he's better suited at the three just because of his defensive abilities and how many twos we already have on this roster. 
But if you also get in foul trouble or have injuries, you know you can at least slide him in there to play spot minutes at the four because he's done it. And he's probably one of your best perimeter defenders on this team. So, you know, you like having that flexibility. But I think Obi, I mean, it's just going to be exciting to see him get this opportunity because this guy is really good at basketball. And I think we're just scratching the surface of what he can become. So get him to Indiana. And I think what's really going to help is if he takes off. We already saw Aaron Neesmith kind of take off. But we've seen Halliburton, you know, all-star, max extension, that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that later in the week. For Halliburton to showcase what he can do by getting this opportunity with Indiana, same with a guy like Neesmith, same with some other young guys like Nimhart and Matherin, if Toppin getting traded here and can really, you know, you know, burst onto the scenes, you're talking about players that are going to want to come to Indiana. And I know that sounds crazy to say, but like when you have young guys that can feast in this system and really get the best version of themselves, they're going to notice that and they're going to realize, hey, I want to play with Tyrese Halliburton, get me to Indiana. So I think this experiment for Obi Toppin, you're hoping that it just, you know, just hits like crazy because you want to make sure you can showcase and sell. This is your sales pitch. You're buried on the bench. Come to Indiana. We'll find a place for you and we'll maximize your talent. This feels like a science fair like experiment over here because if it works <laughs> out for Obi, you're right. Guys might actually, for what feels like the first time, take a l- little bit less to have a bigger role with the Pacers. That's something we haven't seen. But I remember tweeting it out. I remember others, you know, mentioning also that two game audition it felt like at the end of the year for OB against the Pacers it was real you're telling me that front office didn't notice when all of a sudden he dropped 34 and 32 on him in the same week I mean it was just he was doing it all he had, you know he was rebounding he was hitting shots he was extremely efficient one game he was 13 of 23 the other he was 11 of 18 I mean he was getting to the line it was like they knew firsthand okay this guy can play basketball But I want to see him play basketball with a guy that's going to make everybody around him better. Just like you mentioned in Tyrese Halliburton. That's really when you unlock someone's full potential. So that's why it just has me really thinking, man, just wait, guys. Because, you know, you had those some of those people on Twitter like, I just don't see it. He averaged six or he averaged seven. It's like you can't go off of just averaging. Just when a guy's playing 14 minutes per game, some of those games he might be playing a couple, some he plays a little bit more. It's like he needs a change of scenery. And in, in this time, that's when sometimes you're able to get the most out of players. And which franchise really does it better than the Indiana Pacers, who have five most improved player of the world? I was waiting winners. for that. You know it was going to come out because it's real. I mean, guys, we've taken a chance on guys on maybe it's, or their second team, or their third team, whatever it is, and we've gotten the most out of them, either them becoming an all-star, them becoming all-star-esque, whatever it is, the Pacers develop talent. I can't wait for this one. Yeah, it'll be exciting to see, Fachi. So let me ask you this. With Obi's arrival, you- how do you think this impacts other players on the roster? Well, that, it's it's a good question, and here's kind of how I see it. Look, I think first, Josh Walker comes off the bench. I think that's the first thing that's impacted Aaron Neesmith is the other one we talked about before. Look, we saw him play the four. He was playing out of position, I feel, but I think he did the very best he could, and I liked what I saw. It did, but now all of a sudden you start to wonder if you're Aaron Neesmith. This definitely could impact you getting paid as you enter restricted free agency next year. The next player, even though you could slide Neesmith over, uh, the next player, Jordan Awar. Jordan Awar is on an expiring contract. Saw him as a four. Yes, he could play the three, but... That's someone that now maybe I know the Pacers like, but they might end up being a little bit higher, but a little bit lower on Noir than they were a few weeks ago because playing time is going to be a little bit harder for him. So I definitely think that Jordan Noir, Aaron Neesmith, those are the players that are most impacted on who gets brought back if Obi Toppin ends up being who we hope he can be. Yeah, I mean, I, I think looking at it from a standpoint of you're starting five, you're going to keep the same five as last year, but you're going to put Matherin in for Buddy at yep. that two three spot. Nimhart starting with Halliburton, Miles obviously the five, and then you're sliding Obi Top into that starting spot. So now your bench, I, I think what's interesting is your center position a little bit because Daniel Tyus is on basically an expiring contract next year as a team yes. option. You got Jalen Smith on an expiring almost. He's got a player option, and Pacers have a team option to pick up 
for Isaiah Jackson, I believe, before the beginning of this year. So it's a lot of different ways they could work around that. I think now that you've got an additional big that can play the four, it, it makes it easier to slide one of them out because we saw them play together sometimes with the second unit. So I think that could impact them. I think Jordan Moore is a great one to bring up because he might have been the backup four if they didn't make any significant yeah. moves or could have been the backup three. Neesmith uh, is the backup four. But now it kind of makes one of them the third string power forward at this point. And with Brian and Bruce Brown, you know that if he doesn't start, he's probably going to be your backup two or your backup three. Uh, and it makes it more complicated. So I feel like the guys that are most likely on the outside looking in with the rotation, Jordan Moore is first one. I want to say Isaiah Jackson. I feel like Jalen Smith might end up getting a little bit more of a look first than him. But it, it's still determined. But I would I would say keep an eye on the veterans, Buddy Hield and Tuja McConnell. What is their impact going to be on this team next year? Will they be a part of this team next year? Is there any chance that maybe they move off of one of them now that they brought Bruce Brown in here and and Nimhard can kind of play some of that second string point guard and they can stagger minutes? Ben Shepard, I feel like he's going to kind of get buried on this bench just a little bit right now with how everything's working. So I don't think they're done making moves. I think this is just the beginning wave of what's going to happen. I still think they want to bring back some vets maybe one like a George Hill. So they're going to have to clear a roster spot somehow. And I think making another trade, maybe a trade, one of them in the cap space, something like that, get a pick back or second round picks for it could be interesting. So I'm keeping my eyes on that. And there's a lot of different players that you could do that with. But at the end of the day, they got too many guards still and too many centers. And I think their small forward position, uh, I guess if you want to say they addressed it with Bruce Brown, sure. But still feels like there's a hole there overall moving forward and i could see them trying to consolidate to get a small forward still yeah i mean so could i because th th that's the thing is like if you do have buddy still here and it's buddy and and matherin and uh, you know obviously you know ben shepherd and then neesmith and noir like and then bruce, bruce brown, brown if they're all yeah. fighting for minutes it's going to be really tough because a lot of those guys were playing about 30 minutes not not jordan noir but like bruce brown played about 29 minutes per game you know buddy was Right in that same category, same with Matt, you know Matherin in that you know 27, 26, 27. Whatever that it's it's hard. It's going to be hard to get everybody that playing time because someone like Obi is primarily at the four. Jarris Walker you're going to see primarily at the four, so it is tough. I do think they need to make another move. I think now if you are to move a guy like Buddy, I don't think you're going to get the same value you'd probably get if you moved him at the deadline because. He could still be, you know, there might be more suitors out there, whether it's injuries or anything that, that might happen. But uh, moving a guy like Daniel Tice, I think, is going to be pretty important. And I don't think you're going to get that much back. Because if you do want to bring in a guy like George Hill, who might not play that much, but definitely could slot in, and, you know, as an emergency point guard or play any guard spot, it's going to be hard to do that if you already have a guy like Tice who's not really playing that much. And then to your point on Isaiah Jackson, I believe that deadline to pick up that option is, is October 31st. Okay. So right when the season's starting, you know, that's that's going to be interesting. So um, I do think they have another move to make. But, you know, right now, just for uh, on paper's sake, yes, all the guaranteed contract roster spots are filled. Yeah, for sure. So it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. And um, I want to kind of project a little bit here because – if Obi Toppin hits off and he goes in a restricted free agency, the Pacers have a lot of free agents. I put a list out there today in 2024 with some, you know, team options, partial guarantees, unrestricted free agents. I mean, there's probably like, what is it, seven, eight guys on that list? Like half yeah. the team could be gone next year if they don't bring anybody back. Now, that's not going to happen. They're going to bring these guys back more than like we've seen a lot of re-signings and free agency early on. So um, I, would, I wouldn't rule out a lot of them coming back, but... Let's just imagine here, OB Toppin, restricted free agent. You extend him to a new contract. What does that contract look like to you, Fudge? And that's that's probably the, you know, dare I say, golden question, because you don't know exactly what he's going to produce in a much larger role, we'll say. Could it be a starting role? Could be. But I'm hoping I could see something that if he takes a leap forward, maybe something along the lines of about a four years, $56 million. It's right in line with what... Herb Jones and Austin Reeves got. Yep. And let's let's be honest. Everybody thought Austin Reeves was going to get a lot more. People thought that he could have been pushing for much, much more. But in the end, that breaks down to about $14 million per year. 
It's something the Pacers can definitely live with. They preserve those books to look really good. And let's be honest, we thought that P.J. Washington, Grant Williams would have a much bigger market. They're still out there. And then let's take a look at Rui Hachimura, who just re-signed for three years, $51 million. Yeah. And the verdict is still kind of out on him for what exactly he is. That breaks down to $17 million a year. Lakers overpaid, in my opinion, for Rui Hachimura. I think they did. But he's a good trade chip now. Yes. And I will say with the cap going up, $17 million a year is not what it used to be. It's more like Agreed. 13 14 So, you know, you got to have to look at it from that perspective. I could see the Pacers, you know, maybe trying to throw out like a 4 for 48 to yeah. Obi Toppin. Yeah. Um 452, 456, like you said, like mm -hmm. something in that vicinity makes a lot of sense because you don't want to get your book so tied up on these guys that you just don't have a lot of flexibility. So to me, somewhere in that 12 to $14 million per year range does make a lot of sense. So yeah, that's kind of how I expect that to happen. So any final thoughts here, Fachi, on Obi Toppin before we give him a letter grade and sign this one off? Yeah, I just want to say rarely, rarely in life, do you Constantly ask for something. And I feel like a kid. I, I was looking outside to see, is there snow out there? Because it feels like December 25th. That's what it felt like. I felt like I had Obi, Obi Toppin underneath my tree. That's what it felt like. And to be able to get him for what I felt like I found in the middle of my couch, two second round picks. <laughs> yes, all day. And now this is, we're going to have a lot of fun next year. Because let's be honest, the Pacers in the past, there was times where they're a little bit boring. They were, and I don't mean that in a mean way. I mean it in an absolute factual way. We were not at the top of anyone's league pass, you know, team outside of Pacer fans. And now you have people that are tweeting around that are like, hey, you know, oh, wow, this is going to be pretty fun. Or Indiana, I mean, look, I didn't want to be called a feisty team. On, like we got called on ESPN, but like we're ready to make some noise. And I think that now the talent is around to say like, why can't this team give you a handful every single night and be a playoff team. Not just like, oh, you know, we're, we're going to be a tough out. No, be a playoff team. Team that has a lot of guys that want to prove their worth mm -hmm. is going to be very tough to beat because they're going to compete night in and night out. Even if they don't have the most talent as some of their teams, they're going to give it their best, but they're acquiring more talent, which just makes them feel like, okay, we saw what they did last year, 35 wins, right? Can they expand upon that by the, uh, additions they've made and i think they can i would be surprised if they don't win at least 40 games next year so agreed that's kind of where i see them at right now uh we'll see with uh, what other moves they make how they figure things out but yeah you are in love with obi top and you've been in love with yes. the idea of obi top for a very long time i will say this i am not in love with obi top and i like obi top and i like the idea okay. of obi top and i think that it's a great pick uh a great trade i should say a great pickup getting like you said two second round picks like Second round picks get thrown around, you know, left and right in the NBA in trades. I mean, it's just like people, they value them, but they don't value them. It's like, oh, well, five second round picks get you this. Well, it doesn't really. It's just assets to for, for, for further trades and stuff like that. So, yeah, they do have value, but their value is not nearly as valuable as a first round pick, which Pacers still have that one that they traded for at the draft. So keep an eye on that what the players have included. But yeah, I like Obi Top and I'm excited to see what he can do with a bigger role, expanded role. I think our team gets better because of Obi Top and being an addition to this roster. I think he's going to be a great locker room guy. And I think that the excitement that Tyrese has shown about him is going to get other players excited to play with him as well. And it's going to make Obi Top and feel like, man, this is home. So I, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but I do think this is a great fit for both pairs. And I think it's going to work out well. I'm predicting that it will. The fact that the Pacers got him, for two second round picks, to me, this is an A. This is an A. This trade deserves an A for the Pacers. And I'm going to say probably a C minus D plus for the New York Knicks. The Knicks pick him eighth overall and sell him for two second round picks. And honestly, to my you know knowledge from what I've heard from Knicks fans, there are some of them that wanted them to keep Obi Top and, and trade Julius Randle and his uh what would be called an albatross contract, even though it's not that bad. It's just the fact that Julius Randle can be infuriating at times to watch play. So, you know, the, the Knicks decided to punt on a young player that was playing behind Julius Randle. And now their backup power forward is who? Taj Gibson. So, you know, this is a team that they I think they gave up too early on this guy. But that's okay because the Pacers are going to take advantage of it. And I think Obi Toppin is going to get to work. Fachi, what is your grade for this trade? I'm giving it an A-plus because I don't think there's a scenario we could have given up less. Whatever those... 
two second round picks might be. It's unpredictable that any of those guys are ever going to work out or last in the NBA. And some of those picks, sure, they might be, you know, maybe it's like a 2028 Phoenix Suns pick. Okay. Five years from now, let me know what that ends up being. But for right now, we're trying to win games. And I think that at this point, this is that gamble that you always hope your team takes. Like, I want to be in the running on that. And finally, the Pacers were. I talked about Pacers acquired five second round picks between taking on Jordan Wara and, and, you know, moving back from seven to eight. It's like, this is why you do that for when these opportunities come about. So I think Obi instantly improves the athletic ability of this team. Six foot nine, you know, we needed that size, but a true rim running mate for Tyrese Halliburton who fits that you want to play fast style. And it's not like this is just an idea. This is a former National Player of the Year, which ironically now the Pacers have three on the roster between Buddy Heald, Obi, Oscar Shibwe. They're acquiring talent. Uh, oh, that's and, a way. <laughs> ex- exactly, but whatever, whatever. We're going with players that have higher upside than, you know, some guys that we saw in the past that were more, well, you know, I don't know, TJ Leaf or Goga or, you know, any of those guys that you're like, maybe. But look, one of the th- thing for the Knicks Dating back to 1994, the Knicks have only extended one rookie. That's R.J. Barrett. They can't develop talent. And what hurts Knicks fans even more is Obi Toppin's from New York. Like, they never really gave him a shot. And they know that they're punting on a player that this is a mistake. This is a mistake for them. And I think this is a big win for Indiana right now where it's been hard to maybe acquire some guys through free agency. We've always done it through trade. And you know what? KP... Chad, front office, they did it again. They came out on top on a deal, and I I cannot wait to watch this team this year. And that's not necessarily the same mindset that everybody had going into last year when they knew it was going to be a long year. Now I'm itching for the season to come around. Pachi is more excited than the front office about Obi Top, and you can't convince me Maybe. otherwise. I think so. So front office, yeah, you're excited, but <laughs> you need to have Pachi come out there and <laughs> campaign for this guy at his presser. I mean, get him a one-way ticket to Indianapolis. We'll keep him here for a week. Then he can earn some money, go back out, and get that flight home. But, I mean, my God, this this Fachi guy over here is in love with some Obi Toppin, and I'm all here for it. So uh, let's just go ahead and let people know where they can find us at on social media, Fudge. Absolutely. So you can find us on Twitter at SettingThePace3. You can find Alex on Twitter at AlexGoldenNBA. I can be found on Twitter at underscore F-A-C-C-I. You can find us on Instagram at Pacers Talk. You can find us on Facebook, Setting the Pace. You can find us on TikTok, Setting the Pace. And Alex, tell them where they can check us out on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, go to YouTube.com slash Setting the Pace of Pacers Podcast where you can check out all of our video content like this episode here of us reacting to the OB Top and Trade. Thank you all so much for listening. But Fachi, if you're excited to see Obadiah or Richard Toppin Jr. in a Pacers uniform, catch an alley-oops from Tyrese Halliburton, then hit me with those three words. Let's go Pacers! Setting the pace, going to the top. Setting the pace, going to the top. This is your number one podcast, sweeping every team.